20 years ago this week, on September 11th, 2002, I walked with a journalist friend to Ground Zero to be present for the one-year memorial service. I lived in New York then. We couldn't get onto the site. That was only for dignitaries and family members of victims. But we stood in the big crowd gathered on the perimeter of the hole. Suddenly, at precisely the moment when the first plane struck the towers a year earlier, a fierce wind blew in from the same direction that that aircraft had taken. There was a hurricane far offshore in the Atlantic. Um, we were feeling the outermost winds, but it was eerie, really eerie, that they manifested at exactly that moment. I remember standing there looking at my watch. The gale force winds blew for the entire morning. As I separated from my friend and walked around downtown uh, Manhattan, the wind did not end until around the time the Ground Zero ceremony concluded. I went back to my apartment, filed a piece for National Review where I was working at the time, and ended my work day. Then the phone rang. It was my journalist friend urging me to come over. She was really anxious. I rushed over to her apartment. She was visibly shaken. She showed me into her home office and pointed to a small, very old flag mounted and framed under glass hanging on her wall. The flag looked like a Revolutionary War relic. I could tell by the number of stars on the flag. And it was torn from top to bottom. I said, said to my friend, what am I looking at? She said, somebody had given that flag to her many years ago. She had displayed this treasure on her home office wall in every home she had had since then. Nearly every day, she's looked at the flag, she said. But today, when she came home from Ground Zero, she saw that it had torn right down the middle. Nobody had been in her house. The seals behind the frame were untouched. Now, both of us are Christians. We understood the symbolism here. In the Gospel narratives, when Jesus of Nazareth dies on the cross, the veil in the Hebrew temple tore in two. Traditionally, Christians interpret this as a sign of God's judgment. On that day, my friend and I were faced with the sign that, if it was valid, indicated that God has broken his covenant with America. That's one interpretation. We didn't want to believe that for obvious reasons. Nobody wants to believe that, that uh, God is passing judgment on his nation. But it was also hard to believe it, because one year after 9-11, America stood at the height of its power and its national unity. Yeah, we were planning as a nation to go to war soon, that was clear, but most of us believed the war would end quickly and would um, result in a decisive win, it would be a cakewalk, uh, and liberal democracy would reign in the Middle East. After all, America was the world's hyperpower, and we were morally right. And for all the horror of 9-11, it had brought Americans together like we had not been since World War II. Well, it didn't work out that way. Over the last 20 years, America has endured two failed wars coming out of 9-11, wasting blood and trillions of treasure, and destabilizing the Middle East even more than it had been. We've lived through the creation of the national security state. We've had a global financial crash. A powerful anti-liberal ideology, commonly called wokeness, has conquered every major institution of American life, even the military now. We've lived through COVID and the George Floyd riots. Deaths by despair in this country are skyrocketing. Americans are increasingly at each other's throats. Christian faith is in steep decline, and a softer form of totalitarianism is on the march. I firmly believe that we American Christians, and in truth, Americans of any traditional faith and convictions, that we're now living in exile. We know from the Hebrew Bible how God deals with his people when they have been unfaithful to him. He judges them. In the sixth century BC, this meant sending the Hebrews into exile in Babylon for a period. And for us Christians, the country we used to regard as a shining city on a hill has become an American Babylon. We dwell there in exile. We cannot allow ourselves to be deluded about this reality. When I published my book, The Benedict Option, five years ago, people who hadn't read the book accused me of saying, we all have to head for the hills. Well, that's not true. 
I, I've said since then, uh, and I say it again today, that we Christians have to live between Jeremiah chapter 29 and Daniel chapter 3. What does that mean? Through the prophet Jeremiah, God told Israel that he had brought them into exile for a time for his own purposes. He commanded them to settle in Babylon, start families, and pray for the peace of the city. Daniel 3 tells the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three Hebrew men whom King Nebuchadnezzar had made administrators in his government. But when they refused to bow down and worship a graven idol, the king threw them into a fiery furnace. And as we know, God miraculously delivered them from that horrible martyrdom. Well, you couldn't get much more embedded in Babylonian society than to be royal governors, administrators. Yet despite this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived in such a way that they never forgot who they were and which God they served. When they were put to the test, they were prepared to give their own lives rather than betray their Lord. The lesson for us believers today is this. We have to be like these three Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They dwelled among the Babylonians and served them. They were part of that society. But they also, they also lived in such a way that they were prepared to sacrifice even their own lives for God. How do we do this? How do we, we, we dwell here in the American Babylon without forgetting who we are and who we serve? Well, I have a few ideas based on uh, the work in my books, The Benedict Option and Live Not By Lies, the latter of which is based on advice given to me by Soviet bloc Christians who endured communist persecution and prevailed. The first thing we have to do is we must prefer nothing to the truth, prefer nothing to the truth. Babylon is built on a system of lies and depends on everyone agreeing to live by the lie in order to stand. We have to cultivate within ourselves, our families, and our communities a strong devotion to truth. Live not by lies, said Solzhenitsyn. And that means that we have to learn how to suffer. This is the most radical thing we can do in our comfortable, consumer-driven society. But this is absolutely fundamental to the Christian faith, a religion founded by a God-man who gave his life on a cross but it's wholly alien to so much contemporary American Christianity. We have degenerated in, uh, across the Christian churches into what has been called moralistic therapeutic deism. It's a false Christianity that teaches that the most important thing in life, the thing that God wants for us above all, is personal happiness. How can you tell the difference between MTD, moralistic therapeutic deism, and true Christianity? It has to do with one's willingness to suffer. As Kierkegaard said, Jesus has lots of admirers, but he doesn't call admirers, he calls disciples. You can tell the difference between an admirer and a disciple by the acceptance of suffering for the truth of the faith. As Pastor Yuri Sipko, a, an elderly Russian Baptist, told me in Moscow, if you're not willing to suffer, even die for Christ, your faith is meaningless. Happy, clappy Christianity and winsomeness uber alles is not going to make it through what's to come. If we're not talking about the martyrs and the confessors and making them come alive as heroes to our church communities and to our children, then we're setting ourselves and our families up for capitulation to apostasy. If we cannot imagine ourselves or our families singing praises to God in whatever fiery furnace our persecutors toss us into, we are at risk of losing our faith. People don't like to hear that, but this is where we actually are. Third, we have to cultivate cultural memory. Cultivate cultural memory. Cultural memory is, uh, are the stories, the songs, the historical accounts, the poetry, the rituals, the dances, and all the cultural artifacts that a particular people cherish. Because these things tell the people and tell the future generations who they are. Totalitarian movements everywhere uh, aim to erase cultural memory because it makes people easier to control. They become permanent children. When the Nazis invaded Poland, they sought to grind down the Polish people by taking from them their memory of themselves as a distinct nation and a Catholic nation at that. In Krakow, 
a young actor named Carol Wojtyla, the future Pope St. John Paul II, and his theater colleagues uh, came together to write and perform underground plays on Polish patriotic and religious themes. They could, would have been killed and all the audience members would have been murdered by the Nazis had they been discovered. But they took that risk because they knew that the survival of themselves as a people and as a Christian people was at stake. They knew that keeping cultural memory alive under those conditions of persecution was absolutely vital to their survival as a people. It's the same with us. Some of our educational institutions are trying to take away our religious and national cultural memory, but mostly it's happening passively through indifference and uh, blind consumerism. A Hungarian Catholic man in Budapest told me that more of his people's cultural memory has dissipated in the three decades since communism fell than under 40 years of communist rule. That's pretty shocking, and he was aware of the irony when he mentioned that, but he said that's what has happened to a people that has given themselves over to pleasure and consumerism. When a new regime or social order takes over, the first thing it tries to do is to sever society's connection to its past. That process is well underway today with this post-Christian regime. A Christianity that is not firmly grounded in the Bible and in the traditions and rituals of the historic church is going to be swept away by the forces of liquid modernity. The late cultural anthropologist Paul Connerton was an atheist, but he discovered that all subcultures uh, in modernity who held on to their traditions had these things in common. One, they all shared a sacred story. They held a sacred story in common. Two, they told that sacred story and celebrated that sacred story in unvarying ritual. Three, the ritual gave the community a sense that they were connecting with eternity. They were standing outside of time. And fourth, I find this the most interesting, the ritual involved the body. The, uh, Connerton had this lovely phrase. He said that the rituals that use the body sediment into the bones the sacred story of a people. A Christianity that is constantly changing morally or aesthetically to fit the latest fashions is going to disappear. A Christianity that is primarily about affirming theological propositions and logic is also going to fade. Catechesis is important, it's so important, but we also desperately need to embrace embodied liturgical forms of worship and devotion rooted in the historical past. Finally, we need to form thick communities, small groups, and networks of groups. Form thick communities, small groups, and networks of groups. And these groups need to cross confessional boundaries. In reading accounts of Christians imprisoned by the communists in the Soviet era, I was struck by how hard these prisoners worked to pray and support each other across denominational lines. They knew that the reason they were in prison was not because they were Protestant or Catholic or Orthodox. They knew they were in prison because they followed Jesus Christ. It has to be that way with us Christians too in this post-Christian era. This is not just about fellowship. There's a practical reason too. I dedicated my book, Live Not By Lies, to the memory of a Catholic priest named Father Tomislav Kolakovic. In 1943, Father Kolakovic was doing underground work against the Nazis in his native Croatia. He got word that the Germans were coming for him. He took refuge in Slovakia, his mother's homeland, and began teaching in the Catholic University there. When he got to Bratislava, he told his students that he had good news and bad news. The good news is the Germans were going to lose this war. The bad news is that the Soviets are going to be running their country when it's over, and the first thing the Soviets were going to do would be to persecute the church. He told his Catholic students, we have to get ready for this. And he knew what he was talking about because when he was in seminary in Rome, he had studied to become a missionary to Soviet Russia, so he had studied the communist mindset. So Father Kolakovic formed small groups for prayer, for study, and for structured, purposeful discussion. They would come together to talk about what they saw happening around them in their society and what they as Christians could do about it, and then they made a firm decision to go out into the world and act. He called this method CJ. 
Judge Act. Within two years of that priest's arrival in Slovakia, nearly every town of any size in the country had at least one of these Kolakovich groups. Now the Catholic bishops of Slovakia chastised the priest. They told him to knock it off. He was alarming people. It's not going to happen here. Everything's going to be fine. Uh, but Father Kolakovich ignored them, thank God, because he had read the communist playbook and he knew how they thought. Sure enough, when the Iron Curtain descended over Czechoslovakia in 1948, it all happened exactly like Father Kolakovich said. But the Slovak church was ready. It was prepared to endure persecution and to thrive under persecution because the followers of Father Kolakovich had prepared themselves spiritually and otherwise. When I say otherwise, I mean they learned things like how to survive an interrogation without giving up the names of your fellow Christians. This was very, very practical. Well, I say to you, my Christian brothers and sisters in this audience, that we are not only living in an American Babylon, but we are also living in a Kolakovich moment. We don't know how much time we have before the persecution starts, but we can be confident that it is likely to come. I hear from people all the time who read my books and read my blog at the American Conservative, people who work uh, high up in the government in Washington or uh, in the military or in, uh, in private business, and the things they tell me are chilling about how at the senior most level, the, 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 this bureaucracies are starting to see conservative religious believers as the number one threat to America. And uh, it's not a joke, and it's not paranoia. Uh, read the signs of the times around you. Open your eyes and see what's happening. We have seen things in the last 20 years since uh, that, the, the ripping of the flag I talked about. We've seen things that most of us never imagined we would see. We have become a country where the sexual mutilation of little children for the sake of transgender progress is common and defended by even our president. Don't deceive yourselves. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. That torn flag of 9-11-2002 was a prophecy. Am I pessimistic? Oh, yeah, I am. But I'm also hopeful. An optimist thinks everything is bound to get better. Well, I hope things do get better. I hope that all these things don't come to pass. But optimists went to the gulag just as surely as everybody else. For Christians, Hope is not optimism. Hope is rather the sure conviction that even if things get very bad indeed, there is ultimate meaning present in our suffering. That is, we know through hope that God can and will redeem our pain and our loss as surely as he rose from the dead. This is why the book of Revelation instructs us not to weep, quote, for the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. So let's be hopeful but let's also be sober and be ready. Every day, in every way, let us become the kind of people who can say to the Nebuchadnezzars of our own time, in the words of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and this is a quote from Daniel, this is what they, those Hebrew men said to the king, there is no need for us to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, can save us from the white-hot furnace and from your hands, O king, may he save us. But even if he will not, you should know, O king, that we will not serve your God or worship the golden statue which you set up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those men lived not by lies. Well, what about you or me? Whether or not we will have the strength and courage to do that at the time of testing tomorrow has everything to do with the decisions we make today. Thank you very much.